Now, there's a motto for Solutions House, and it is answers only. And we know the problems are real around climate change, but they are very well discussed elsewhere. So we are going to do our level best to focus on the solutions and the answers. Um, now, this is the first year that Solutions House has graduated from the Futera offices. So welcome to our new space. Uh, it's the same deal. There'll be lots of Futerans around to help out if you need anything. And Taggarter the dog, who was the star of the show, last year will be turning up at some point later today to greet her adoring fans. Her bed is down here. Um, so uh, we have uh, no um, uh, fire alarm or anything like that planned. So if you uh, please do proceed to the exit if you do, do hear anything. Toilets are back here. We've got teas and coffees at the back. Um, and everything's streamed. So if you ask a question from the floor, you will be included um, in the readout from the session. We have some hashtags, Solutions House, and also Climate, White, Climate Week N NYC. I'm Lucy Shane, and I am the CEO of Futera, and also a trustee of Futera Solutions Union. And Futera Solutions Union is a relatively new nonprofit, and it's been set up to work on narrative, storytelling, culture, to flip the script from doom to solutions, to work on culture change to beat climate change. And that is why I am so delighted that we're opening Solutions House with this fantastic panel of storytellers and change makers to talk about which one wins. Where are the stories of hope and possibility and how can we activate them? And then to moderate this panel, I would love to welcome Dr. Kirsten Dunlop, who's the CEO of Climate Kick. And Kirsten, please take it from here. Thank you very, very much, Lucy. Good morning, everyone. It is a real pleasure to start Climate Week, for at least personally, because I know for many, this has not been the start at all, but it has been a long weekend leading to the Pact for the Future. But to start Climate Week with a session that reflects on what it is that we are choosing to do and how we are choosing to frame and tell ourselves about those choices. The title of this session refers to the Cherokee parable, the Cherokee story of the two wolves. I'm sure you know it, but just in case you don't, it is a story about an internal conflict in all of us. And it frames it as a story of two wolves who are fighting within our minds, our hearts, our souls permanently. One representing hope and possibility and one representing fear and darkness and despair. And the story, the purpose of the story is to ask a question. In this eternal conflict, eternal struggle, which one wins? Someone must know this story well enough to know the answer to that. <laughs> the one you feed. The one you feed the most. And I think for me, that is the purpose of this panel. We are not here to discuss whether telling ourselves foolhardy stories of possibility while the world burns is a better way of creating the future that we need. We are here to talk about how our minds, our hearts, our sense of possibilities change when we feed a sense of possibility. And we are ultimately, in that case, here to talk about dynamics of change. Systems change in our societies, in our minds, in our relationships to one another. The possibility of something that is malleable, that is makeable. We are not locked in to an automatic default future. We have choices about making it, but those choices need to be fueled by our understanding of what it is that we are feeding in our own sense of possibility. So this panel is really about instances, examples, reflections on what are we feeding, how are we feeding it, and how does that enable action. And I am pleased to find myself surrounded by so many <laughs> exhortations from the past and the present with respect to that possibility. The best way to predict the future is to create it and to, to frame it. So it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here. I'm going to introduce one by one as we go our panelists. 
Uh, and we have a couple of questions for each and a question for the whole panel. So let's make a start. And I'm going to start with uh, Ambassador Chimbiri uh, and start with Lucy in a joint session here together. For decades, we have been working on a theory of change that has had to do with building and nurturing a sense of fear. The science of the IPCC report, the climate science, I came yesterday from sessions within uh, the context of the Summit for the Future, and particularly a session last night uh, with the Club of Rome and Earth for All, which was naming over and over and over how extremely dire the situation is, and above all, the extent of, of horror that is dawning, that is, that is building in the scientific community for how long we have been saying this is what will happen and for how long we continue and we fail to act in this is what will happen. So our theory of change has been make people aware how disastrous, how difficult the situation is and they will be triggered to act and once they're triggered to act we can start to sort out and make transformations in ourselves. And it's not working. We see it's not working, we see that emissions rise, we see that action is continuously asymptotically reduced from where it needs to be. Knowledge doesn't seem to be enough. Our challenge is a deficit of imagination. My question I think is, what do you see Lucy first and then Agnes as the lever, the biggest lever to change that deficit of imagination? Thank you, Kirsten. Um, so, to answer that, I was reflecting how... So, when I, I grew up in south-east London, and my mum uh, was uh, a teacher, and she would go and campaign at Greenham Common, which was the part of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. <coughs> and I was reflecting how I've never forgotten those stories, she told me. She'd come back and tell me these very moving stories of the women coming together, scaling the fences, holding hands, singing songs, and I just thought it sounded fantastic. And they won. And I think that really set me on the path that I've chosen from my career and kind of what I do. And what, the, what that story was, it was stories of um, character-led action. And when we look around, I mean, Kirsten, just to double down on what you said, there is, there's a problem. If you look at the narrative frame around climate and climate action, there is one dominant overstory that we see primarily, not exclusively, but primarily, and that's the earned dystopia theme. And what that means is man creates monster, a monster destroys man, the Frankenstein or the golem. It's a, it's a deeply held mythic base that we see in many cultures around the world. Um, hubris means death, basically. And the problem is, that's, that's the story. If we tell ourselves that story, that's the story we'll go into. Now, there are a few other narrative frames that have kind of appeared. Um, you know, the kind of tech saviour one, uh, Iron Man, or um, Hunger Games with kind of youth m mutiny. Um, but the thing I think that we need is many more and diverse stories from different perspectives. We could see these coming through from um, indigenous storytelling, from kind of messy utopias where we don't try and pretend everything's kind of perfect and clean and squeaky in the, in the new future. Um, and again, things very much around character-led action. So the thing I would say is if you're thinking about your story in your organization or you as an individual, there are a couple of plot holes that we know that need fixing and we can see some ways of fixing that. So one is that agency piece and role models and character-led stories are a way of giving agency. Um, and again, that's what I took with me from my mum and her stories of Greenham Common. Thank you very much, Lucy. Let me go from stories of holding hands and winning <laughs> to what's happened this weekend. <laughs> this weekend, the UN convened a summit of the future, the first summit of the future. Um, Ambassador Chimbiri, Agnes, if I, if I may call you that, was present. Um, and I, I would love to hear, what did you see in the role that storytelling played in managing to get to an agreement, no matter how imperfect, an agreement that stories us forward into acting together. Thank you very much, Kirsten. 
and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really an opportunity for me to share with you the story of what happens at the UN and what happened in particular as we negotiated the impact of the future. It was really very interesting. Whilst we do send, each member state sends the experts, these are younger experts from the ambassadors. They discuss what needs to be included in the pact, the way discussing, telling us. But one thing was common, was that they were always talking through the experiences of each member state, which means every expert was talking about their countries, how peace and security issues are affecting the people out there, how issues of climate non action on the climate or lack of climate financing is affecting our people, to negotiate a text so that the other side of the member states, you know, we talk about the West, the North, and all that, they should understand why we say, please put in as much money as possible for climate action. It was talking about, we were talking about experiences of our people, experiences of how wars are really impacting of girls and children, women and children, all those experiences. So the most common thing was humanity. Everybody was talking about how humanity is being affected by lack of decisions, by to allocate enough resources, lack of decisions to include the youth, the future generation itself. Because if we are talking about the future, it's not our future, isn't it? We are already living our future, but the future of our children, of our grandchildren, that's the future we were talking about. So despite having differences, different levels of development, each member state, the West, the North, the South, the Global South, who were meeting, and it was very interesting, the G77 and China was like, what is it in there for us, for our people? Then the issue of culture. Somebody brought in the fact that we need to make sure that cultural issues are also addressed in here. Why? Because our people usually speak through culture, cultural practices, cultural songs, the cultural dances. If you want to know what their concerns are, what their happiness is, what is working, what is not working, they will tell you through the cultural songs and dances. So it was the same as we negotiated for the pact. And this weekend, one country decided to say, let's defer. This pact, we did not negotiate uh, through intergovernmental processes, but it was not true. We did. We were negotiating between countries, and we were moving. And we agreed that we did not get the best impact, uh, impact of the future document, but we got something to start with. To me, the most important thing is that we started telling each other stories, listening to each other, and agreeing, and all in a multilateral system, we have agreed to start the process of negotiating about the future of our children. Thank you very much. And I, that notion of we started to tell each other stories about the future of our children, and we started listening. That is a wonderful reflection for what we might be doing this week. <laughs> How much are we listening to one another? Atosa, let me come to you. You are representing the heart and lungs of this planet, the Amazon, the Sacred Headwaters Alliance of the Amazon. What do you see in the role of storying in how story has played a part in bringing together indigenous tribes across many different nations to bring a voice into the world of powerful change. Thank you for that question and for inviting me today. Um, <clears throat> you started by saying, you know, the Amazon, the heart and lungs of the planet. I think metaphor of who we are and how we fit on this planet is really the paradigmatic work that we must do. 
Um, we've coming out of 500 years of mechanistic worldview that saw the Earth as this dead rock on space. And indigenous peoples invite us to see the Earth as a living being, that the rainforests are alive, that the trees are sentient, that we are a strand in a web of life, not on top of the web of life. We're not here as supreme over the web of life. So human supremacy and domination is part of the, what has brought us here and to recognize that what indigenous peoples invite us to in this idea of kinship ecology where everything is our relative. We, all my kin, all my relations, the two-legged, the four-legged, I come from a clan that's the bear clan or the, the dolphin or whatever that is. This is relationality to the web of life. Invited, uh, indigenous people also invite us to think about what is a human aspiration on the planet? You know, are many of us go to school, we get our degrees, we seek success, we have a framework of success, professional success. Indigenous peoples invite us to have um, really evolutionary success, being good ancestors to future generations. That invites, um, you know, a different value system, a different ethic of how we go about our, you know, who are we listening to? Are we listening? Indigenous peoples invite us to go through vision quests and commune with the ancient trees and to commune with other beings that are visible or non-visible, often saying we're walking on the, basically uh, we're walking on the, unborn, on the basically faces of unborn generations. The future generations are here, we're walking on their, uh, you know, basically where they would be emerging. So I think that those are the paradigmatic values that I think invite us to imagine a different world. Even though indigenous peoples are often a great risk to themselves fighting battles, life and death battles, uh, when you're in their villages and their communities, what you sense more than anything is the joy, the communality, the communality, the being in communion with nature and with each other, this idea of you know, children playing beautiful um, scenes of interactivity and safe inter relating to, to the forest. And so, you know, I think when we started the work in the sacred headwaters, we did a lot of doom and gloom analysis. We saw that 80% of the headwaters bioregion, which is the most biodiverse part of the Amazon basin in Ecuador and Peru, in the headwaters where the Amazon is born, um, is threatened. If you do business as usual scenario, you see roads and dams and pipelines and oil drilling and mining. The picture is bleak. This area is also one of the most culturally diverse areas, mostly indigenous lands. So when indigenous peoples really saw the future vision for their territories, they said, this is not our vision. And so we went on a process that included vision quests and ceremonies and elders talking to come up with a different vision, what is the indigenous people's vision. And that was communicated in a bioregional plan for the permanent protection of the headwaters. So we launched that plan after four years. And we thought, no one's going to read this plan, much less understand the, the totality of the holistic nature of the transformation that indigenous peoples are inviting. So we uh, embarked on a project called Amazonia 2041, a vision from the future. We made an animated film about how we had won, how we had permanently protected the headwaters, and what are the things that took, what are the stories, what were the you know, anatomy of the success. And it was imaginary, and we like, imagined what we did, but it has received a really amazing um, feedback of people saying, I see it, I can believe it because I see it. And it's this idea that we are invited to basically reimagine what is possible, looking into the past, but also looking, uh, you know, in actually looking at how would nature solve these problems? You know, uh, we often think we have to solve all these problems from a perspective of our intellect, when we really can look at basically the glorious in, uh, genius of nature through biomimicry, through the way plants communicate, the way forest distributes its nutrients to the way mycorrhizal networks create holistic emergence 
uh, and life flourishing is like the drumbeat of nature's life flourishing. How can we incorporate the lessons that already is all around us if we could see with this perspective of uh, seeing the world from a living earth perspective, how could we borrow and adapt and solve the problems that we face, whether it's economic distribution of resources, whether it's um, you know, creating uh, transformation, how does nature do it and how can we involve those lessons in the solutions we, we build? And I feel like that's where the, when I give talks, a lot of people really feel that that's where the energy is, that's where they, they're motivated and feel inspired. So I'll Thank leave you. it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Atosa. I was thinking about, I, I am one of those people who was privileged enough to grow up in wild places. And I often reflect on the fact that if you have never been in the quiet and the noise and, and the living space of a forest, how do you relate? Hmm. How do you relate to what it means, what's at stake, what gives that sense of life and the richness of possibility? And so I'm going to pass from you to Vina. Because I know in my role, uh, leading an organization that is really trying to constantly craft solutions and bring answers, one of the things that we wrote in to our strategy from here to 2030 is that the thing we understand now we are in a race against is despair. And particularly despair of younger generations looking at inaction, looking at lack of courage, looking at vested interests, looking at a sequence of poor, Un unimaginative, self-interested decisions. You have started a Climate Youth Negotiators Academy. I'm super curious about how have you, or how do you help people learn to tell a story of hope and possibility <coughs> as a weapon, as a way of bringing the future into being? Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten, and thank you all for being here. So um, hope is a big word, right? Um, you know, we all talk about it so easily. For us, hope was about justice. Hope was about fairness. You know, we constantly hear about these multilateral meetings. All the countries are meeting together. We see that we keep hearing that, oh, I mean, the headlines in the newspapers says, the climate crisis is a leadership crisis. Uh, it says young people are the hope, but uh, our politicians are taking, ha shaking hands with the young people, taking pictures with them, but they're not inside the rooms. What, like, what kind of hope are they giving you if they just shook hands with you, right? So we wanted to change that. We wanted to bring that trust back in the multilateral system. We wanted to work towards climate justice, and we wanted to enable and empower young people as the architects of their future, as the decision makers, giving them a seat at the table. And we recognized that, yes, I mean, for 30 years since the start of the UN Climate Convention and the other three environmental conventions, the Rio Conventions, young people have been asking for a seat at the table, saying that, yes, I mean, we also understand and we want to be co-creators, architects, but there's no mechanism that or a bridge that gets them inside as professionals who are potentially talented to also contribute towards their future and the decisions that are made towards their future. So we thought maybe we need to do something about it. So we wanted to like, you know, address the systemic inequality of young people's representation within. And we were like, OK, we need to work with the existing system. So how do we do that? So we started working with countries directly. And we tried to understand the gray areas as to how you could get to you know, like work with the existing system and still bring about that systemic change by disrupting the existing system. So, what you said, ma'am, that uh, the Pact for the Future, it has loopholes, that hooks that you can sort of take, go forward with. So every policy decision, our systems in general, have these hooks and loopholes. And what we do is sort of like hook onto them. Anyway, so what we do is we work with countries directly. We tell them, you will sign an agreement with us. We will train and build community and network and capacity for the young people, for your country, 
to be leaders, to be a part of your negotiation teams. And they can then bring the stories. They can connect with the young people on the ground. They can connect with other women on the ground, ground indigenous communities, those who are actually doing the work, and really create that pipeline and be there inside with you. Also understand the positions that the country takes and what it needs to take and what are the diplomatic relations and so really making sure that this young person is fully skilled, has the leadership skills, the knowledge, the technical expertise that they need when they're inside the negotiation rooms because if you do not have that when you go inside then that is also a big problem. So we give hope to the young people by building their leadership cap capabilities. We also recognize that when you're there for the first time inside, you are absolutely new. Nobody's going to listen to you. Nobody, I mean, there are these informal discourses. One is the procedural justice, right? So that we like take away by actually getting them access inside the rooms. And the second bit is the acceptance, informal discourses. People don't have to listen to you. Just because I have the mic, do you have to listen? No. So how do we then change that? How do we give them the networks that they need, the peer group that they need, so they feel safe enough to bring their perspectives inside? And that's. That's our way of giving them hope that they can be change makers and they can then take that story forward. The last bit is also, uh, I wanted to just quickly touch upon how we look at their well-being because again, the UN space or the diplom diplomatic space in general is like in a way so man-made and so constructed that Sometimes it feels like it is not for people. My own first, like when I was inside a negotiation room at one of the COPs, I was like, what are we talking about? We are making policy for people, but there's no humane you know, discussion. And it was about a comma, it was about a full stop, it was about what can we cut down, how can developing countries not get what they want. So it was very fascinating to see that it's not a safe space. We don't care about people's well-being. We don't, we don't give them that peer group who can support each other and look for solidarity and like build solidarity as that goes forward. So we take care of these young people that we train by giving them those safe spaces, taking care of their well-being, seeing how can they have the tools that they need to take care of themselves if they're caring for the rest of the people and the planet. So these are some of the things that we do to give the young people that we train the hope in, in the hope that they would be able to take that and pay that forward. Thank you. I actually, I, I was just thinking about the, uh, the experience across different COPs and the journey of discovering this extraordinary parallel universe of discussions that somehow is detached from any sense of the living earth, the living people. So I think it's a, an extraordinary effort to create skill to translate and to humanize a process. And I noticed in the Pact of the Future that there is something that sounds remarkably like Ministry for the Future, a future envoy, an envoy for future generations. So yes, the hooks that perhaps we can build yes. with. Shaba, I'm gonna to come to you, because I, I want a question to all of you, but it would be fantastic to hear your voice. I mentioned Ministry of the Future. I was thinking when Atosa was talking about the effect that the film Avatar had on my children on beginning to actually make them think about what it means. You've worked in the arts and culture for years, and your profession is around this question of translating. What do you think the arts can do more and different now to unlock public imagination powerful enough to get the kind of change we need to happen to ourselves? I think hope is uh, really an emergent quality that is rooted in our experiences and relationships. And uh, it was interesting to hear you guys talk about how you were talking about different ways of creating relationships and, and, and using that as a source of hope with each other, with, uh, with nature. And I think art is experiential. It is one of its unique powers that it can engage us in different uh, and, and a unique way that is more holistic and human and works with emotions. <coughs> and it is capable of shaping relationships. Imagine, for example, I mean, we can figure out any kind of solution, but if we don't have that relationship foundation of trust, we probably won't be able to pull it off. And, uh, and I think art, integrating art in this way with many other efforts of solving things is key because too often art is seen as a decoration and a standalone thing. 
We're not thinking about bringing all these together and using art's unique power to integrate it with all other efforts. And I want to draw our attention to one point because it, I, I think that we need imagination not only about possible futures, but also about pathways of solutions and change. Uh, we are trapped in so many ways, in, in ways of thinking, behaving, relating, and we need creativity to break out of, uh, out of that. One of the things, for example, that, that we have been talking about is that we need, to, when we talk about narrative shaping, uh, we need to break out of the advertising mindset of messaging. And that also needs to be more experiential and more rooted in doing and connecting and relating. And just, uh, uh, just two examples that, that kind of highlight this, not so much at global scale, but um, one example in Bogota, uh, traffic accidents. Um, and I think it was about changing or replacing 200 policemen with mimes. And the result, the overall result was that uh, traffic accidents came down by 50%. It is incredibly, it's, it's a different way of engaging and working towards solutions. Another one in Florida, the idea of the Underwater Homeowners uh, Association. And then uh, basically just um, putting out signs where the water level would be in X number of years and, uh, and connecting those people who will be affected by that. Uh, so these are all artful ways of engaging. And I think it is key to bring that, that artfulness back into our solution strategies and have artists and, and the artists within us work with the more functional, more industrial-minded uh, solution scenarios. And, and just one last thought maybe that, that I often I, I, I think about uh, arts in a way that, that it is or it has been almost like a, a natural reserve for certain human approaches and qualities in the face of the onslaught of the industrial solutions and industrialization. And I think it is, it is really time to, to bring, oh. oops, to bring, to bring back, to bring back those qualities and infuse that into the world uh, uh, with working with politicians, scientists, all across the field. So I think in many ways the key word is, is integration. Thank you, Chava. Okay. I'm going to ask each of you an example. I was thinking, I'm a historian of, of cities, so for me, medieval and Renaissance cities in Europe were built by artists and architects literally bringing to being a picture of what to become, the new Rome and Jerusalem, so powerfully that over 500 years, governments changing every six months stayed committed to bringing those kinds of physical realities and social and political realities into being. Feels like we need something like that a crafting collectively of our, of our sustainable, balanced ecological future. So let me ask you, and I'm going to start with Lucy and come back this way. What are examples? Let's talk examples. Where do you see examples of the power of a, a story or a narrative or a cultural practice so compelling that it has brought people to somewhere they didn't think was possible? Um. Just before I answer that, just go, go back on your example there of uh, uh, medieval history. The power of stories is actually, there's an evidence base on it. We're 22 times more likely to believe or remember something if it's framed as a story rather than facts. Yeah. So we talk a lot about climate science, um, which is important, but there's actually a science to storytelling as well, and it has a very strong evidence base attached to it. Um, my example is, it might sound a bit um, silly, but uh, I'm reading at the moment with my six-year-old at home the Dragon Realm series. Uh, it's a kids' um, set of stories, and it's by Katie and Kevin Chung. And I had been reading, I got to about book three, and it's, you know, swashbuckling, it's, you know, <coughs> dragons, it's adventure, it's intrigue, it's four kids working together to defeat 
a set of foes. Um, and there's lots of stories of resilience. And Vina, I was really struck by your piece there about kind of, you know, community building. And there's lots of loyalty and friendship within there. But as I say, I got to about book three and I suddenly realized it was a climate change story. It was about people coming together to work together to overcome a big societal level issue. And actually, as you come and get through, they essentially reverse a dystopian future. But climate change is never mentioned. And that's why I bring it forward, because sometimes you might be in a situation where you can't talk about climate. You know, it might be safeguarding issues. You might be, or, you know, when we do work with the Step Zero Coalition, I see Eric sitting at the back there, and with creators and influencers, some folks can't mention climate. There would be ESG pushback, etc. But there's ways of talking about it, using metaphors that you spoke about earlier. And Atossa, I remember you gave me some stickers last year from your um, pieces. I took them home to my kids, and, and we talked about it afterwards as well. So yeah, ways of, you can use parables, allegories, and different stories about what we need to do to overcome climate without mentioning climate. <laughs> Thank you. Gemma. I'm going to stick to experiential. Uh, I'm going to uh, bring another example. And this was in, uh, in Kenya. And, and stories can be simple if you live them. It, they just kind of become emergent. And the story is about, uh, um, it was done by an artist named Yasmani Arboleda. And uh, in Kenya, it, the idea was to paint churches and mosques yellow together, uh, but bringing together the communities. And that became a story of those communities coming together, uh, talking, getting to know each other, finding uh, uh, finances for that. And that created or established a very different uh, relationship foundation for those communities. And all those things that seemed impossible uh, to solve before that became possible on that foundation. So what I'm talking about is creating those foundations can actually be that missing piece to get what we need done. Thank you. Vina? I actually want to build upon yours about creating foundations that, might, that would enable us to do the things that we thought were seemingly impossible at the start. Um, I want to take an example from COP27. So that was the first time we had trained a cohort of young negotiators. And they were from 26 different countries. And because we are a global program, they were with all UN regions. Um, so there was this particular negotiation on adaptation that was going on inside COP, like at COP27. And, um, we had, there was, it wasn't moving forward. It was stuck for three days. It just wouldn't go forward. And it was between one was the Latin American country groups, a group, and the other was um, the small island countries, the um, uh, island nations. And somehow they were not able to go forward at all. And there was this thing. Um, interestingly, we had negotiators that we had trained who were a part of these countries, like the Latin American countries, and they were also negotiators who we had trained who were a part of the small island countries. And when it, it didn't go forward, these two ne like negotiators from the two different groups, because now they have been a part of a cohort, they've been trained for the last six months together, and they have that sort of friendship that they said, okay, let me just like come talk to you and like they spoke to each other really trying to understand and they were able to empathize with each other and the needs of the other that they were able to recognize understand take it forward to the respective groups and they were able to then showcase okay what was the problem in a way that the groups would understand and then there was consensus and they were able to move forward from there and that was a decision that was then passed like at cop 27 so for me, that was, that, that's a story of hope because when we are stuck and it feels like it's seemingly impossible to go forward, building that foundation and those relationships and those connections, it can take us to the next level and I wanted to share that in this moment. Thank you, Vina. Natosa. Um, something that I have found is, um, again, back moving from 
um, human supremacy to sacred reciprocity as a frame of what we're attempting to bring about a value shift. We um, talk a lot about the vital organs of the biosphere, giving people an earth systems perspective of how, how does the earth actually work? You know, how do the atmospheric rivers, how does the Amazon rainforest generate atmospheric rivers that drive rainfall around the planet? How does a tree evapotranspire a thousand liters of water vapor per day into the sky? And then, the, you know, picks it up, uh, the trade winds pick, pick those uh, atmospheric rivers and generate a river bigger than the Amazon River around the planet and how basically the Sahara dust windstorms bring phosphorus rich dust that dumps it over the Amazon and replenishes the phosphorus the Amazon lost through rain. I mean, how does Gaia really work and how do we inspire people to really understand that they are a strand in the web of life and how we as a, a you know, we can see ourselves as cells in a body of a living earth and realize just in our own bodies, every cell works to keep itself alive while it keeps the host alive and that we have a host. Let's remember we are on this planet, we have a host. Bringing about that kind of um, paradigmatic shift I think is, is really interesting working with youth or working with um, you know, activists. I've found that those are, um, you know, the astronauts saw it, the overview effect, seeing the Earth from space inspired a whole revolution of consciousness. So I do think that those are ways that we can bring people, through, whether it's through virtual reality, into experiential learning about how we fit into the larger picture. And so, yeah, I would say that's been um, my experience, that that's been something amazing to, to be able to create and share. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I would like to share with you my own experience. I lived the green life in the nature, where I used to collect water, collect firewood in the greenery. I even shared to harvest you know, honey in the bush, to hunt. I did that. But then that nature, <clears throat> that green forest is gone. I have that experience, I have that life. Now living, I go back into the village, it's all dry. My own people can't find firewood. Now what I feel is that we need this type of platforms at UN, for example. The world leaders need to hear these stories so that they can connect with their decisions to say, what is it? We are here at the UN representing the people are there the life that they are leading is not the life we are leading here. So for us to understand what they are doing, we need to hear them. We need to hear those who lived the green life and then those who are living, how they have moved from green life to the gray life now, where water is difficult to find and all that. And in our countries in Africa, we still don't have pipes in many places. We need to bring water from very far. Even down, the water table is very low. So we need to hear these stories and be able to identify the solutions for these problems that our people are living. And another example I'll give you is that I visited Roosevelt Library here in the US. You know how he used to make people-centered policies? He used to have let's chat sessions with the people on the radio. So the, he still have there's that radio where he used to sit and say, let's chat. And hear his own people talking to him. And which means he could hear the stories of these people, how they are living out there, despite he was in his office. So this is the thing that we need the UN to listen more to the stories of the people the way they are living. And Malawi, for example, let me tell you, we call it a Malawi is the warm heart of Africa. The people have hope. They do believe there are all the possibilities and therefore they haven't lost hope. They are always smiling, but the forest the nature is going. How do we help them recreate this nature? And Roosevelt made young people plant one billion trees. Can we do it today? 
I think this is where we need our young people to really take action, move forward, and be, and be part of the creation of this future. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I remember that one of the stories that really stuck with me, and I was thinking about your reference, Lucy, that we're 22 more times more likely to remember a thing as a story, was listening to somebody who has been surveying all of the populist movements across the world, um, both hard left, hard right, everywhere, and said there is one pattern in every single one of these movements for why they're so successful. They're not telling people what they should do. They are reaching out to say, the world needs you. It needs you, we need you to act now, to do something, to come together. And I think there's some really interesting questions around, can we create the let's chat and the reach out to us as individual actors of change to do something together? So this panel is gonna reach out to this audience. There are a couple of people that we ask to listen and to play back to us. What do you think, what have you heard here that you think all of us should take home? What do you think everyone in this room could consider feeding and acting upon, even in this week? And I'm gonna ask Marie Claire Graf and Domingo Pies to say a couple of words, and then we'll open up to any questions that we have on the app if we have some time. Marie Claire, uh, do we have a mic? <coughs> have we got the handheld? And I'm, I'm going to use this little small intermission to, to explain that Marie Claire and Vina are tea, our team, I could say that, yeah. uh, in really thinking about the voices of young people in different on angles in the world. But you have a very particular angle on that. And the mic's just coming. <laughs> this, this is our first session, so bear with us. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Thank Angela. Thank you very much. Here we are. Thank you so much. So a couple of reflections I had was that the words you chose were very powerful to really inform the hope. So many of you talked about the leadership, not about pure engagement of kind of like something on the side, but we talked about the leaders who are leading today and engaging. You talked about representation of all sorts, not about just participating somewhere in a session on the sidelines, you talked about putting the rights in the middle of what we are doing, not just about share like stakeholders which we are informing because it's nice to inform them, but no, it's the right to engage and it's the right thing to do. But also you talked a lot about decision making throughout all of, of the different um, panelists over just the sheer dialogue we are having because once we take the decisions, that dialogue comes anyways. And all of you stress that this needs to be done today and not in the future or tomorrow and kind of really brought it in the here and now. And I think the words you all used were so powerful to inform that we really have to move. And I think that's what ultimately flows and sparked the hope into the audience. These are a couple of points I, I captured and I wanted to reflect back and now I would love to hand it over to you. Buenos dias a todos y a todas. Good morning to everyone. Eh, mi nombre es Uyuncar Domingo Pérez, soy indígena de la Amazonía Ecuatoriana. His name is Domingo Pérez, he's an indigenous from the Ecuadorian Amazonian. En honor saludar a todos y felicitar a todos los ponentes. It's an honor to say hello to everyone and to uh, congratulate all the, all the panelists. Solamente quería hacer una pequeña reflexión desde vuestra visión moderna, uh, científico, desde la visión indígena. I would like to just say a little reflection about the modern landscape versus the indigenous landscape of, of this topic. Bueno, nosotros, eh, los indígenas, estamos habitando casi todo continente. Yo represento como presidente de Alianza Cuencas Sagradas en Perú y Ecuador. Y la visión nuestra es casi similar a todos los miras indígenas. Um, the indigenous people live basically in all the Latin American countries, in all the continent, and him as present basically represents all the indigenous vision as a whole. Para nosotros, 
Eh, todo lo existente de la Amazonía, el ecosistema, es un ser vivo y toda nuestra visión que recibimos es a través de nuestras plantas sagradas. For them, the whole vision they receive uh, to the planet is like a living being, and they receive these visions through the plants and the animals. Esas plantitas son tabaco, ayahuasca, floripondio. The plants are tobacco, ayahuasca, and floripondio. Cuando yo quiero, o cuando tengo debilidad, o cuando yo quiero alcanzar el propósito, tengo que ir a la selva en ayunas. When he wants to achieve these kinds of visions, he has to go to the jungle uh, fasting during a fast. Y tomo mi planta y ahí recibo la visión que yo quiero alcanzar. Once he consumes the plant, he receives the vision he wants to achieve. Pero esta visión es el poder espiritual que manifiesta sea animales, aguar, o árbol, o arpías, o el mismo río, el viento, que me da el, la visión que do, debo cumplir. This vision, he interprets them through the animals, plants, water, elements that he wants to contribute to. Y esta visión es colectivo, interés colectivo para mi hijo, para mi pueblo, el buen vivir del pueblo. Eso es lo que me da el mensaje. This vision is a collective point of view, per collective perspective through his sons, through his family, through his, com through his community, which allows him to do that work for them. Yo estoy aquí por la visión que recibí por ayahuasca. Estoy cumpliendo lo que me dio. ¿Qué debo hacer yo? He's here through the vision that he received, perceived through the ayahuasca, uh, making sure that mission is accomplished. Eh, no es visión personal, no es visión como yo quiero, porque eso te trae ego, competencia, interés personal. Now, this is not a personal vision, because if you make it from a personal vision, it just brings ego, just, it just brings uh, uh, competition, and basically not helping the, well, the community. La pequeña experiencia que quiero decir es que a mí me indicó cómo está la planeta Tierra, cómo está el problema climático. Y lo que me dijo es que yo debo llegar con este mensaje a hacer gran conciencia y gran alianza para caminar juntos. The vision he received is how can he help this planet How can he help generate this consciousness? How can we com uh, combat climate change? And how can we make people more um, uh, aware of this issue? Por eso estoy aquí, de tan lejos, invitando hombres, mujeres, niños, niñas, sabios, sabias del mundo, porque ya no hay tiempo. That's why he's here, so he can invite basically all the communities around the world, men, women, children, uh, wise men also, so they can contribute to this cause, because there's no more time. Thank you. Sé que todos estamos por el mismo propósito, y gracias por escucharme. He knows that everyone here is on the same purpose as him, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are going to need to wrap. Can I ask us to hold, to see if we can hold the perspective of what is our individual indigenous capabilities? Because each of us comes from roots. That helps us hold those stories, ground them in the earth, ground them in our hearts. Let's go through this week, seeing if we can listen, seeing if we can translate our experiences into personal stories, and seeing if we can find a way to tip the balance towards something that feeds itself upwards into a possibility making that was larger than the space that existed yesterday. 
Thank you for being here. Good morning. Good luck this week. Thank you very much, Lucy, for hosting us. And uh, good luck for Solutions House this week. Bring in the answers. <laughs> Thank you, Kirsten. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone.